Hello everybody, this is Basim with Join the Graph. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to use gremlin.net to connect and send traversers to a Gremlin server from an ASP.NET application. First, we need to have a Gremlin server running. So I will, to, you download the Gremlin server from tinkerpop.apache.org from this button right here. And if you're going to follow along, you will also need to download the Gremlin console because I'll use the Gremlin console to add some sample data that I will later pull from the ASP.NET application and display on a web page. I already downloaded both the Gremlin server and the Gremlin console. So I'll go to the Gremlin server root folder and then bin and then Gremlin server.bat because I'm on Windows. So the Gremlin server was started successfully and it's now listening to port 8182. Next, I will run the Gremlin console, like I said, to add some sample data. I'll go to the bin folder, then gremlin.bat. First thing I want to do, I want to connect this Gremlin console to the Gremlin server. So I'll say remote connect dot server and the configuration file is conf slash remote dot yaml and then i'll say remote console and this will send all the following commands to the server without having to proceed them with colon and greater than okay now it's time to add a couple of vertices so i'll say g dot add v and the vertex label will be person it will have a property the property name will be first name and the property value will be first and i'll have another property and the property name will be last name the property value will be person so this will create a vertex for a person named first person and this created a new vertex and because i didn't specify an id for this vertex so tinker graph chose an ID for me and it chose the ID zero for this vertex. So let's execute the same command again, except this time person's first name will be second. So this is second person. I'll execute that and it created the vertex and gave it the ID three. So this is the sample data that we will use to, we will use from the ASP.NET application to make sure it's working correctly. Next, I want to start working on the ASP.NET application. So I'll create a folder for my ASP.NET project and let's call it Gremlin Web. And let's open a terminal here. So I want to create a new .NET project. So I'll say .NET new and I'll use the web app project template. Okay, so this project was created successfully and here are the project files. Next, first thing I want to do to this project, I want to um, add the gremlin.net NuGet package to this project. So I'll say .net add package. The package name is gremlin.net. And this added the gremlin.net NuGet package. And now I want to open this project in Visual Studio Code. So I'll say code dot to open the current folder in Visual Studio Code. And first thing we need to do, we need to register the types that um, we will need to use to, to create gremlin traversals and send them to the gremlin server. So I will register the gremlin.net client side types. And you do this from startup.cs and particularly from this function, from the configure services function. So the client side types or objects that we will need to register are a Gremlin client. First, we will need a Gremlin client. Here is the namespace for the Gremlin client. And the second type we will need is the graph traversal source. So we will need to register these two types because we will need to request them later to run some Gremlin traversals. The Gremlin client is what you use to send 
um, scripts as raw strings to the server. And this is something you generally want to avoid as much as possible. But for some tasks, like for example, creating indices or defining the database schema, you will need to use the Gremlin client directly for that. But most of the times, you will be using the graph traversal source to create Gremlin traversals and send them to the server. So we will need to register these two types with ASP.NET container. And whenever you're registering a type with the container, the first question you need to ask yourself is what will be the lifetime of this type or of this service? And the ASP.NET container gives you three options for uh, the service lifetime. It's either a transient service, and transient means that a new instance will be created for you every time you request an instance of this type from the container. So this is the transient lifetime. And your second option is um, scoped lifetime. So when you register it as a scoped service, this means that only one instance will be created per HTTP request. And this same instance will be reused throughout the HTTP request. So this is the scoped service lifetime. And your third option is registering the service as a singleton. And when you register a service as a singleton, this means that only one instance will be created for the application lifetime. And the same instance uh, will be reused throughout the application lifetime. And this is the scoped option. So let's consider each of these two types and see what lifetime we will choose for each of them. First, the, the Gremlin client. The Gremlin client is thread safe. And this means it can safely be used in a multi-threaded environment, like a web application environment, where you have multiple threads running concurrently to serve concurrent HTTP requests. They can all be using the same Gremlin client instance. It's designed to be used this way. It is thread safe. So it's perfectly fine to register the Gremlin client as, um, um, as a singleton. Also, another consideration is creating an instance of Gremlin Client is a very expensive operation. So you don't want to do this more than once in your application. Um, because the Gremlin Client, it contains a connection pool, and every time you create an instance of the Gremlin Client, it creates as many connections as needed to fill this pool. So again, creating an instance of Gremlin Client is a very expensive operation, and normally you'll not do it more than once in your application lifetime. Well, the only reason I can think of to create more than one Gremlin client is if you want to connect to multiple Gremlin database servers, because this Gremlin client, it's bound to a particular a Gremlin server. So if you want to connect to a different Gremlin server, you will need a different Gremlin client instance. So this is the Gremlin client. We, will, we decided that we'll, we will register it as a singleton. Now let's consider the graph traversal source. The graph traversal source too is um, a thread safe type. So it's perfectly fine to use it in multiple threads, same, use the same instance from multiple threads running concurrently. Um, so the graph traversal source too can be a singleton. But the difference between the graph traversal source and the Gremlin client is that creating an instance of the graph traversal source is very cheap, assuming that you already have the Gremlin client that's required to create it. So um, it's okay to you register it as a transient service or as a scoped service. And one reason you may want to do that is because the graph traversal source is bound to a particular graph on the database server. So if you want to connect to multiple different graphs, you will want to create a graph traversal source for each of these graphs that you want to connect to or that you want to traverse. For our, um, for this test application that I'm creating right now, we will be connecting to only one graph. So there is no reason to have multiple instances of the graph traversal source. So I'll just register it as a singleton. So both of these types will be registered as singletons. I'll copy and paste the piece of code for registering these two types. And then I'll explain this code. Let me first format it a little bit nicely. So 
we register the Gremlin client as a singleton and we provided the factory method that will be used to create this Gremlin client. The factory method takes a service provider and it will end up returning a Gremlin client, an instance of Gremlin client. And to create this Gremlin client, we need to first create a Gremlin server. And the Gremlin server, this provides some information about the server, like the host name and the port number the server is running on. Right now, we're connecting to this local server that's uh, running on local host. So that's why the host name is local host and 8182. This is the port that the server is listening to. And we will not enable SSL because this server is not using SSL. And the server doesn't require a username or a password. So we will not provide the username or a password. Of course, in a production application, for sure, you will you will be connecting to a secure server and you will need to provide this information. But here we don't need to. Also, in a production application, probably will you will pull this from some configuration source. You will not hard code this information. But this is just... Um, a simple example. Second object you will need to create the Gremlin client is the connection pool settings. Like I said before, this Gremlin client, it contains a connection pool and it uses connections from this pool to actually execute the Gremlin traversals. So these are some in configuration um, options for the, for the connection pool. First, uh, we tell it the the max in process per connection. That's the maximum number of Gremlin traversals that can be executing concurrently on the same connection. So each of these connections in the connection pool can execute up to 32 concurrent Gremlin traversals. And the pool size, this is the number of connections in the pool. And we said here that the pool size is four. So the pool will contain four connections and each connection can run 32 traversals concurrently. So to get the total number of traversals that can be running concurrently, you will multiply four by 32. And if you ask the Gremlin client to run yet another request concurrently after it exhausts all its, uh, all its connection and e each of the connections is maxed out, with the 32 concurrent request, if you try to, to make it execute another Gremlin traversal when it's maxed out, you will get an exception. Another configuration property is the reconnection attempts. We said here that the reconnection attempts is four. So it will attempt to connect to the Gremlin server four times, and it fails. if it fails for the fourth time, then it will throw an exception and will not retry to connect. Next, we have the reconnection based delay, and we chose that the delay will be one second. This is because there is some delay between the connection attempts. We said there will be four attempts. So the one second delay, this will be the delay between the first attempt, and if the first attempt fails, it will wait for one second, and then it will try a second time. And if the second time fails, what it will do, it will wait not one second this time, it will wait two seconds between the second and the third attempt, assuming the second attempt fails, right? So between the second attempt and the third attempt, it will double the previous uh, delay and it will wait for two seconds instead of one second. And if the third attempt fails again, it will wait for four seconds this time. It will uh, double the previous delay, which was two seconds, and this time it will wait for four seconds, and then it will try to reconnect for a fourth time. And if the fourth time fails, then it will throw an exception, because we said that the reconnection attempts are only four. So it will only try for four times. If all four times fail, it will throw an exception. Okay, now that we have the Gremlin server and the connection pool settings, now we will finally be able to create the Gremlin client, and we will return it from this factory function. Okay, so this was um, registering the Gremlin client. Next, we need to um, register the graph traversal source. So again, I'll copy some code from here. And we said we will register the graph traversal source as a singleton. 
And here is the factory function that we will use to, to create the graph traversal source. Let me first add this namespace. So the factory function will take a service provider as argument. And first thing to create the graph traversal source, we need to have a Gremlin client. So I will use the service provider to get an instance of the Gremlin client that we registered here above. And after we get the Gremlin client, I will use it to create a, a driver remote connection, which takes a Gremlin client and also takes the name, the identifier of the, of the graph traversal source on the remote server. So this G, this is the same G that we used here. So if you use G, this is the server side graph traversal source and its identifier is G. And our client side graph traversal source has to be bound to a server side graph traversal source. And here is the ID of the server side graph traversal source, this G. Okay, now that we have the driver remote connection, we will be able to use it to create um, a graph traversal source and configure it to use this driver remote connection. So this is how we register the graph traversal source as a singleton here. We registered the types we need and now it's time to write the gremlin traversal. So I will write it in the model for my home page index.cshtml.cs. Right now, the template, the ASP.NET Web Application template injects an iLogger. I don't need this iLogger. So instead of the iLogger, I will inject a, Gremlin traver a graph traversal source. And I'll call it underscore G and we will use constructor injection. And now that we have the graph traversal source, we can use it to run gremlin traversals. And I'll write my gremlin traversal in this onGet method. Again, I'll copy and paste the piece of code. So this will get the people information from the database and assign them to this property, people. I'll create a property. Let's look at the Gremlin traversal. So we say g.v to get all the vertices, and then we filter by only the vertices having the label person. And then we use the project step to specify exactly what data do we want to get from each person vertex. We want, these are the column names, the ID and the first name and the last name. And these by step modulators specify how to get the ID and the first name and the last name. So the ID will be the vertex ID, t.id. And first name will be the value of the first name property. And the last, the last name value will come from the value of the last name property. And then we call the to list terminal step to actually send this traversal to the database and get the result. So this will work, but there is a small enhancement I'd like to make. This is um, a network IO operation. And right now it's executing synchronously, means th meaning that it blocks the thread until the results are available. And then the, the thread execution continues. And this is not ideal because in .NET application, you always try to execute um, network IO operations asynchronously. So you do not block the thread. And gremlin.net does offer us a way to do this. Instead of calling the to list terminal step, I'll call promise, I'll say dot promise. And promise takes a delegate. So I'll be able to provide a lambda expression that will take the traversal as argument and will call a terminal step on the traversal to list in this case. So this is what you do to execute the gremlin traversal asynchronously instead of synchronously. But now this promise is returning a task 
instead of returning the result directly. So we need to await this task to get the result. And await can only be called in um, an async method. So this onGet method, we need, we need to make it an async method. So I'll add the keyword async. And instead of returning void, it will return a task. And to follow the conventions, we will add async to the function name. And this is all what we need to do in the model class. Now we have um, we have the traversal results assigned to this people property, and this property can be accessed from the view code. So I'll go to the view right now, index.cshtml, and I will delete this code that came with the template, and instead I will paste this code. So this will check if there are any people in the people property, if there are any items in the in the people property. If there aren't any items, it will display this message. Otherwise, it will display the table. And here are the table headers. The headers will be ID, first name, and last name. And then we will iterate through this, um, through the list of people. And let's check the type of people. So people is an I list of I dictionary of string objects. I want to discuss this type a little bit. Too bad gremlin traversers do not return strongly typed .NET objects, but we get lists and dictionaries. So the list will hold um, the list of people records, of person records. And each record will have an, a dictionary of string objects. So for each record, it have a dictionary of key value pairs, the keys will be the property names, and the values will be the property values. So that's why we have an I list of I dictionary of string object. So we will iterate the list. We will iterate through the list, and each of the list items will be an I dictionary of string object holding the person's property names and values. And then we will render a table row to display these property values. So from the person dictionary, we'll access the property by its ID, by its key, which is ID here, and first name and last name. And these keys, these dictionary keys, they are coming from the keys that we provided to the project step. So you have a, ID, a key ID and first name and last name, and these are the same keys that are used here to access them, the person property values. And this should render a table with a record for each of the person vertices in the graph database. So let's run that and see if it works as expected. So I'm in the web project root folder and I'll say .NET run. Now I'll open this in a browser. And the list or the table was displayed as expected. We have two records, one for the first person, one for the second person. This is the same data that we populated here from the Gremlin console. So it is working as expected. We managed to pull the data from the graph database and display it on a web page. So this concludes today's video. I will upload this project to GitHub and I'll put a link in the video description. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and please stay tuned.